everybody and welcome to Cabaret Secrets. My name's Gary Williams and today I'm joined by a real virtuoso musician of the flute. He studied at the Royal Academy in London and later privately with the great Sir James Galway. He's worked as a principal flautist with the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic, the Opera House at Lyon in France and with the State Symphony Orchestra in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Welcome, Gary Arbuthnot. Thank you. Nice to be here, Gary. Good to see you. A lot of musicians work all their lives. They dream of being a principal player in a great orchestra. You were there, and you sort of seem to have given all that up to work as a headline act on cruise ships. What was the attraction? Uh, you know, I, I loved the idea of all the traveling. Uh, the cruise ship life allows us to travel all around the world. Um, I love more the flexibility and the freedom of sort of being my own soloist, uh, putting my own, the challenge of putting my own show together, uh, and trying to cross those boundaries really between sort of classical and popular music. Because you know one of the challenges we have out here at sea is is we really don't know who our audience are going to be on any given night. So um, I appreciated that, and I guess the travel and and just sort of being my own my own boss really. Big change, though, from sitting in the middle of a big orchestra of 80 of musicians to standing out there on your own. What, what made you think you could do that? Uh, well, I've always loved being the soloist ever since I've started playing. I, you know, from I guess even from the first concerts I did, maybe at 14 or 15 years of age, you know, I loved being the person out front. I loved being the soloist. The born show off. Yeah, well, I don't know, <laughs> maybe. But, uh, um, you know, the, the orchestral repertoire is, is fantastic. I mean, and to sit in the orchestras, I had the chance to play with um, and play some of the, the great orchestral repertoire with some of the great flute solos as well uh, was wonderful. Um, but I just, you know, when I started, I started doing the cruising by accident, really. Yeah, how did it happen? Uh, I started initially, I got invited to go along and do a couple of classical recitals um, on a company called Fred Olson back in 1995. And so I would maybe go out once or twice a year with a pianist and we would do maybe four different recitals during the course of the cruise. And so I did that for about five or six years. And then I was actually having trouble uh, getting a pianist to come with me on a particular contract just because of the length of the time. And, of course, they had other commitments as well. And so when I was on board, somebody said to me, hey, why don't you put sort of your own headline show together and then you use the band that's on the ship and, and come out and do it. Well, this was in 2001, and back then, I don't think there were any other flute players who were doing it. I'd certainly never seen anybody else doing it as mm. a flute player. So um, it was all sort of very brand new, and, and I, I uh, sort of asked around, got some advice, got some help, and um, then decided, well, you know, let's give it a go. Um, at the time, I was playing as the principal flute in Sao Paulo in the orchestra there. And uh, we decided because the job there was a there were t uh, was a double solo position, so I only had to be there six months of the year anyway. Right, right, right. So and my schedule I could work out with my fellow solo flute colleague. Uh, so we thought, well, what we'll do is we'll put a couple of these cruises maybe in between uh, my orchestral commitments and see how it goes. And uh, basically, I had been in the orchestra maybe for about a month, and um, my agent rang me up and said, "You know, do I still have to be in the orchestra because they could fill my entire year with the cruising?" Well, so, how many how many shows had you done as a as a headline act um, at that point? None. Oh. <laughs> I, I so somebody had confidence in you. I think so. Um, <laughs> it, this was in the, uh, let me see, I spoke with my agent or, you know, we decided to work together in the September of uh, 2001. And I remember the following week it was 9-11. Wow. which is why everything was up in the air, like cruise lines were crumbling, mm. Renaissance cruise lines collapsed overnight. Mm. I remember you know, seeing all eight ships in Gibraltar at one time, mm. just all lined up. And um, so that's one of the reasons why we also you know, said, let's mix it with the orchestra stuff, because we didn't know how many I would get. But I think back in 2001, as I said, there were no other flute players. So uh, I think the cruise lines were attracted to the idea of it because it was something different. Um, it wasn't another uh, a magician or singer or even violinist, you know, who they already had maybe a lot of. Mm -hmm. And I think my agent was just, he was very good at selling me and, and managed to get a lot of dates and, or had access to a lot of dates if I wanted to do them. And this them. was before you even had a showreel or I, anything? I, I didn't. I had no showreel. I had nothing. I mean, it would be, I would, I, there's no way I could do that today. I was just thinking, I mean, no. it seems so hard for people to get in with cruise lines today. It's a different it's, world. 
It's a different world, 10, what are we now, 12 years on? Um, 12 years ago in 2001, uh, there was a certain, I think, attitude towards cruising that if you didn't um, have a real job, then you went cruising. Right, it was always sort of looked down upon yeah, a little bit, so. wasn't it? You said everybody wanted to work on land first, yeah. and, you know, if you couldn't really get anything on land, then you might end up on a ship somewhere. Absolutely. That's exactly was the mentality. And you were sort of looked at like that as well. It's changed a bit. Hasn't it has it? changed a lot uh, because now a lot of those people who were turning their noses up at it 12 years ago are now sort of on the phone saying, hey, how can we <laughs> get a cruise? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I wonder if you can help me. Um, so I think, you know, my timing was perfect. Um, as I said, there, there were no other flute players out there doing it. Um, actually, there, there might have been one. There's a lady called Bettina Clemens, who I've never had the privilege of meeting. She's but, lovely, I can yes, tell you. She's I, a everybody who's met her tells lovely. me she's She's crackers, but she's lovely. <laughs> and uh, so she was... Uh, she had maybe been doing it, but very, in a very different way. Like she does a show with uh, 20, 30 different types of flutes from mm. all around the world mm. and, and so on. Very different but how did you know saying. where to start? Because if you were <laughs> kind of breaking the mould, I suppose you had your own heroes like James Galway and mm -hmm. people. I mean, it, did, did you have some kind of template that you copied that you, you know, based your first act on? What did, how did you know what to do? Well, I mean, I've been putting, I guess, my own recitals together, even within the classical world for years. Um, and I also, I'd done, a, you know, even since I was about 15 years old, I was doing concerts at home to uh, a non-classical audience. You know, your, your, maybe your local choral society or, or some local school were doing Christmas things. So I had an idea of, of how to uh, reach sort of the general public. Mm. Um, and certainly, a, you know, a great um, research was done, you know, just, just watching, as you said, Sir James Galway, I mean, who was you know, one of the first people to really handle that crossover element uh, from classical to popular back as, you know, in the late 1970s. So you just got a bunch of probably videotape I mean, your DVDs were out there well, they? Those, uh, yeah <laughs> DVDs videos you know we didn't have the, obviously you don't have the internet access like we do today right now you can just get on YouTube and yeah, look up there. everybody you yeah, can yeah, see yeah. everybody new. no I mean I, so it was it was certainly you know it was a lot of experimentation but I think when I first started it was very much looking at it as um, like, like a classical crossover concert except I was not instead of using you know maybe an orchestra or, or a pianist that I would have done traditionally within the classical world I was using obviously the ship on board I sorry the ship on board the band on board mm. um, and so therefore I had to make arrangements for that and did you do those yourself uh, no I had help from people who I think are better at doing those things mm -hmm. than I am or so I mean I could do them but they'd probably take me two months right, to do right, what they right. do in a couple of hours yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so yeah I, I you know I put together what I thought would be a good selection of, of music uh, for the broad spectrum of, of passengers that would be on board and I also had a bit of knowledge of it because for about the previous five to seven years before that I'd been coming on doing classical concerts. Right, so of you course. could actually, you were in a great position to sit and watch other acts doing what they were bringing on board whether it was singing or whatever and seeing what the audience responded to the most. Absolutely, yeah, and because we would go to all the concerts, you went to all the shows, all the yeah. concerts, and, and it's one thing I, I always recommend. I mean, I get come across some people these times go, oh, I don't know if I'm going to go to that show or this one, and I always recommend to everyone. I mean, twelve years on, I still go to every single show. Yeah, it's on board because you never know where you might pick up a great tip yeah. of what to do or what not to do yeah. sometimes, yeah. or just get great ideas for music or great ideas for oh, you know, maybe I could take that idea and and mold it into something that I could use instead. We've always got to be tricky not to nick stuff. Of oh, course, no, we you'll know, soon you, get a reputation no, as this no. is for nicking stuff because there are people that do, right? And their I, name, yeah. we, we, I'm, I'm no, I know we both could name a bunch yeah. of people because they're famous for it. But you're right that it's, you know, it's good to watch shows and sometimes you do get an idea of the way that someone's opened a show mm -hmm. or the way that they've placed a certain song yeah. or the certain type of things that are working and, you know, we can take that idea and mm -hmm. make it our own, right? Which is the fun of it, actually. Yeah. It's just, if, if you just nick something, where's the pleasure in that? No, but plagiarism is not something I condone, absolutely in a way but you know with their with the limited probably amount of music and pieces that are it's inevitable people would do the same thing mm -hmm. but and yeah exactly I'm talking more about style I'm talking more about you know, maybe it's a structure thing or maybe mm -hmm. not you know even if it's the same piece you can do the same piece in a different way mm -hmm. um, I'm interested in how I know, of course, you know, we're always learning and we're always changing what we do, but I'm interested in for the very first show that you did, how long did it take you to sort of get it kind of about right, you know? 
I think I'm still trying to do that. I, know, I, know, I knew you were going to say that. Always, and I'm, I'm the same. We're always, <laughs> but but how long did it, do you think? Into, I mean, you did your first one, and you, oh god, you know, probably you had to go away and change a lot of things, or maybe not. <laughs> you know, I mean, how long did it take you till you thought, gosh, you know, I've, I think I've just about kind of know what I'm doing now. Um, it's a good question. Um, I don't know if there's there's ever been a a point uh, where maybe I've thought that oh yes I've got this done now because mm-hmm. I think every time I maybe come close to that I've realized actually no I'm nowhere near it mm-hmm. um, I you know I started I, if I look back and think of maybe the set lists of, of things that I was playing back then or the style in which I was delivering it I think it's it's been um, you know it's be, it's been evolving over 12 years mm-hmm. um, to the to the point you know maybe to the show that I do these days mm-hmm. um, and it, that's just come through the experience of doing it Mm. I think just doing it day in day out. Um, as to when, I mean, I would say it's. I would say it probably was a good year. I would say I would give myself. I would say maybe a good year to think. Okay, I'm. I'm beginning to feel really comfortable with this, um, and especially coming from a classical background where you know the idea of talking to an audience is is so something I would have done in my own recitals, but it really wasn't something you did in a classical concert you come out you, you know you played your pieces you probably didn't say anything it was all on a program note so that idea of of talking and um you know developing that relationship with your audience was probably the newest thing for me rather than necessarily what i was playing mm. um, so i think that's what took me longer to get a grasp of mm. and, and it's interesting because i have a friend now who's uh, recently put together a, a show working on cruise ships mm-hmm. just started doing he's just on his first few shows and uh, you know he's come back with more questions than he went off mm-hmm. with, and mm-hmm. which is great, you know, because he's and I know he's going to make lots of little changes. And I think you probably, I think it's probably the same for me as well. Maybe a year, maybe mm-hmm. what, maybe a, a hundred shows, fifty to yeah. hundred shows of of doing it, and you keep tweaking and tweaking, and the, mm-hmm. so that you make most of the changes. I've I've been changing it ever since, but a lot of changes within the first year until I thought. Okay, I think I kind of know what I'm broadly doing. Very now. much so. I mean, I think for me, probably one of the the biggest errors I made, I think, at the time was this idea of even what to wear on stage. Mm. You know, I went out and maybe I was informal in a, in a tux or whatever because that's what I was used to. And so I said, well, maybe you should dress down a bit. Or just... And then the biggest mistake I made, I think it was on the second cruise I did. I remember it was even the first I mean, the first one, because I'd certainly learned by the third one, that was for sure. Um, <laughs> I came walking out in a pair of leather pants and a pink shirt <laughs> on a seaborne cruise. Oh, my God. Which, so this uh, is a very high-end, yeah, very sophisticated yeah. cruise. Six-star line, top of, the, top, of the, top of the range. Did somebody tell you it was an Atlantic gay, oh Ad- Ad- Atlantis gay cruise? <laughs> no, not like that. I, th- I, I remember it was the Seaborne World Cruise. That's what, what were you thinking? I have no idea what I was thinking. But put it like this, it never happened again. <laughs> it never happened again. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know if it was somebody had said something or, I mean, I looked at the video and thought, what on earth was I doing? Just what was I doing? It's quite tricky to know what to wear, though. I think for, I mean, for, for, especially for girls, I suppose. Pose, but mm. for guys as well, I mean, we seem to have we'll, we have less choice than women do. Mm. We're going to probably wear a suit unless we're going to go for leather pants. And you know, do you wear a tie? Do you not? Do you kind of go for this kind of casual, more relaxed thing, or do you go for a tuxedo, or yeah. do you go for something that's you know sparkly and very kind of showbiz, or like a white suit and mm-hmm. white shoes? And uh, you know what you well describe what you wear now for your act. Uh, now I have a, a, I mean, until recently I was wearing a suit actually I'd find in Venice. It just, it's, uh, I, I don't go myself for the, anything that's sparkly and, and things like that, but I do. Why like, not? Um, I just don't like it. Mm. I, I personally don't like it. Mm. Um, I don't think it reflects me. And I think whatever you wear on stage, you have to be comfortable in for a start. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've tried a few different things when I first started out after the debacle of the um, uh, pink shirt and the pant, leather pants. Um, I moved into it. I found a beautiful, uh, it was like a long Versace, um, nearly velvety type formal jacket, um, which I wore within the context with maybe a waistcoat and formal, like like a tux thing. So very smart. Uh, very smart, and which did for a while. and then, But, you know, 10 years later, it's a little bit dated. Um, just the, I think the outfit itself and so then I moved to just like a, a regular suit but something with a, a bit of a pinstripe that just it stands well on stage 
Um, and being Irish, I've gone for sort of maybe a green shirt with a green tie, and then recently I took the tie off, and um, have only been maybe using the um, without a tie. I was interested to casual. see that. I saw you work the other night, and it was a bit more casual. Mm-hmm. And it was I was interested in that and uh, why you chose to do that because your show is quite sophisticated, quite stylish, and you seemed uh, less well dressed than your show suggested you know okay. the music and the repertoire mm-hmm. but i know that you've done that for a reason you, we, you're trying to create a more sort of casual vibe or a more kind of relaxed approachable thing obviously you've given that some thought yeah exactly as you said i think you know it's still staying i think a little bit um more towards the formal element but just you know taking the tie off making it a little bit more casual that way would you wear the tie if it was a formal night for the guests you know what i think i would because i've heard guests complain about acts not looking, not actually following the dress code for the night. <laughs> and so the, the acts are actually less well-dressed mm-hmm. than the guests. And sometimes the guests don't like it. And some of the acts say, what are you talking about? It's a costume. It's mm-hmm. a, you know, it, what's that going to do What what you're wearing? You well, my, <laughs> when I hear that, sometimes I say, well, you know, you uh, traditionally on most cruise ships, the production show will be on a formal night. And most of the girls are in <laughs> little skimpy outfits, sometimes yeah. bra and underwear. And, you know, that is certainly not formal. So I do laugh when I hear somebody <laughs> complain about the fact that somebody didn't wear a tie. Yeah. And I, I did hear there was an act I remember on a certain cruise line years ago and uh, who came out and was singing a show. And he was, I mean, he was in a beautiful Armani suit. I mean, absolutely impeccable. Uh, beautiful shirt, open collar, didn't wear a tie. Um, and he was slated by the guests on this, but it was a very high-end six-star cruise line, and, mm. and there were a lot of comment, uh, complaints come in that he wasn't dressed well enough because it was a formal night. Could something like that mean that he just wouldn't get hired again? I mean, how careful do we have to be? Um, I think if it, it's if it's a line where maybe passengers are giving some ratings to the acts, then, yes, yeah, some of them would mark them down because they haven't got that. And if a cruise line is basing their rehiring agenda on the, the ratings that you get from the guests... And some of them do. And some of them do, then, yeah, that could have an impact on you. So I think you have to, you know, each ship is different. Um, each, you know, uh, so you have to be very careful and be able to adjust wherever you are. If you come on board any of the six star lines, a Crystal, a Seaborn, a Silver Seas, or a Region, you're going to want to be more formally dressed. And that includes even during the day. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you're on maybe... And you see that in the guests, right? You, you do. You just need to sort of keep up, keep in line with what the guests are doing. You don't yeah. want to be slopping around in, you know, sweatpants no. in the day while they're all in kind of still smart trousers. Absolutely. I mean, we're here on Crystal right now, and, and I know, you know, their general rule that they ask us to adhere to is that we're one above the guests. Mm. And I think it's a very simple rule to, you know, tonight is a formal night uh, mm. on board here, um, you know, and it is, you know, either tux or, you know, a jacket and tie. But I know for us, we'll all be in tuxes because that's that's really as high as we can go mm. um, if the guests choose to dress down a little bit, which is we would consider, let's say, going back a few years informal mm. with a jacket and tie. And, the, you know, when I, if you go on Cunard or the old days of the QE2, you know, a jacket and tie was informal and then a tux was formal. Mm. So um, I think, yeah, everybody just has to play it by ear and realise where you are and, and how you adjust for that. You've done the act now thousands of times, probably. Mm-hmm. You must get bored playing river dance, uh, you know, whatever, <laughs> Danny Boy or whatever, a thousand times. You know, people say to me, you must get sick of singing New York, New York, mm-hmm. you know. Um, does that stop you from performing them? Oh, never. Absolutely not. Um, and Anything I don't... for the ratings? Eh? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I think, you know, I think a show, there's many things to consider. You've got, obviously, you want to put together a, a show that you feel is going to appeal to the audience on the ship that you're on. And that will also change, uh, just like we're talking about dress codes there, that your music and show may also have to change from mm. ship to ship or line to mm. line. Because uh, what is suitable on one may not be suitable on another. Um, I think that's important. I'm not sure a lot of people realise that guests or acts actually mm-hmm. that, that are starting out that, of course, the show that you're going to do on a ship like Crystal is going to be different to a show you're going to do on Royal Caribbean while the school's kids are, are on holiday <laughs> and there's a lot of families on board, right? Yeah, very much so. And, I mean, when I first started, I remember my agent at the time telling me, you know, you have to... I had a requirement of having two full 45-minute shows, separate shows. Mm. Excuse me. And... Uh, he said, even if you don't 
need it or required to do it on board, you, you need to have it because you will need it probably for some of the lines. Mm. And uh, now, so I started out like that. And what I find interesting sometimes is meeting some, maybe some new racks and they come on and they don't have that. I mean, they have one and maybe they'll have another 15 minutes. Mm. Um, but what having the two shows allowed me was even if I didn't um, need to do them in the on the cruise I was on, I had a whole other 45 minutes of material like I had flexibility with then that I could swap stuff in and out mm, of. Mm. One, it kept my interest up. Mm. Um, two, it gave me the flexibility to, to change the show as I needed to depending on the audience. Mm. Um, and I could add in things that were maybe different styles which would just add that more variety really. Mm, mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've, I've obviously been doing the show now for 12 years. And uh, but over those 12 years, it's, you know, continually evolving. You're always putting new stuff in, um, not only, I think, to improve the show, but also to keep yourself sane as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, like doing one recital program over a whole year. Now, you get to know it really, really well. Um, but then what I like to do is I, I usually keep pretty much keep the structure of the show the same. Um, and I will find an alternative piece to replace one that's in that particular slot in the show. That does the same kind of that thing, that's in the same thing. kind of style, same kind of feel, same kind of tempo, but exactly. it's just a different number. You have a similar kind of exactly. structure that you use. Yeah, um, and one that, again, has come about over the years of doing it. Um, I know we were chatting the other night. I mean, you could take a, a piece that uh, you think is a great opener and just dies a death. That doesn't mean it's a bad piece, it just may not be suitable as an opener. Mm-hmm. You may find that if you move that back a couple of numbers or you maybe put it towards the end of the show or somewhere else that you've got to experiment with mm-hmm. to find it, that suddenly it's great if it comes at a different spot in the show. And the important thing for people to remember as well, particularly new acts, is that you know we can do a show. We think, wow, we've nailed it. What a great response. Everybody jumped to their feet mm-hmm. and you do exactly the same show with exactly the same band a week later. You're even on the same ship, just a different audience mm-hmm. and it just doesn't seem to work. And it's not necessarily always us, is it? <laughs> audiences change a lot yeah. the mood that they're in the day that they've had mm-hmm. so it's important I think not to make knee-jerk reactions think oh yeah, that was all wrong I messed this up or I need to change the end of this set because actually you could do exactly the same thing again the next week and it could go down a storm oh without a doubt if there's any one industry or business that will um, let's say get rid of the ego it's working on cruise ships mm. um, because y- you are you know you are a star one week and they don't want to know you the next mm. um, and and that's that's important to learn um, and again you know you've got to give yourself a bit of time to think well what is working now if you're getting negative responses every week <laughs> then maybe you know something needs to change but yeah just based same. on one show that's that's wrong to do and for the lines as well i've spoken to cruise directors and bookers and they and i've said you know i used to get really worried about ratings mm-hmm. but the sensible ones anyway just look for consistency don't they i mean mm-hmm. they're, they're looking for a pattern mm-hmm. and if an act does consistently well and then there's a couple of, a, a bad one here and there they know that it's unlikely to be the act mm-hmm. if there is a pattern that things are getting slowly worse over a period of a year over a year say mm-hmm. uh, and things are generally worse now than they used to be then they're going to start asking questions but if we all have the odd bad night I think most employers are going mm-hmm. to take a view on that aren't they yeah and I think a great example of that is uh, a friend of mine recently um, just sort of finished booking his year with one particular cruise line and and has got a ton of work with him. And deservedly so, because he's a great act. Um, but some people were bemoaning the fact that he's got so much work and maybe they don't have any. And, and uh, the comment came back, you know, from the booker in that particular instance, saying, look, if, if, you know, if anybody else had the scores that you've had consistently mm. for the last five years, mm. then I'd be mad not to book you for the whole year. Mm. You know, so it really, you're absolutely right. Consistency is very important. You know, anybody trying new stuff can always, it can go up or it can go down. And I don't think they're really too concerned about that. Um, but if you, you know, they, they are definitely, if you're consistently a good act and suddenly you have a bad week, they'll probably go, oh, what happened there? And they might take a look at it. Oh, well, actually, if you look at it, the entire ship had a bad week. Mm, it wasn't mm, just you. Mm, and I think it's important to remember that, you know, you are not out of context of the rest of the ship. Mm. Um, and, you know, and every ship differs with its rating system and so on. And, and I think you, at the end of the day, you have to believe in your show and you have to believe in yourself and you go out and do the best thing possible because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether that rating is a 10 or a 1. You're the be- hopefully, you're your best and worst critic. Mm. Uh, and you will know if something has worked well or not. And... It could simply be, you know what, this is not the particular line 
for you. Mm. Uh, doesn't mean you're not going to work on that. You know, people that work really well maybe here on Crystal um, don't necessarily work so well maybe on, on another cruise line. Mm. Uh, let's say maybe Carnival or Royal that want maybe a, a big flashier type of show. Mm. Mm. But likewise, vice versa, those acts may not work so well on a Crystal or a Seaborn or a Silver Sea. So it's only by getting at and doing it and trying it that you you start to find your niche of which lines work better for you and, and how you develop the show to work best in those situations. Do you think you have to be funny in your act? No. I think you have to connect with the audience. You don't I have to tell jokes. You don't have to don't make them laugh. To jo- no. I, I think you have to be, again, it comes back to who you are. Your show needs to represent you. There's nothing worse than trying to get somebody who isn't funny telling jokes because they think they have to tell a mm, joke because mm. that's just, it's not who they are. Mm. Um you know, if if you are a if if you are a more serious person, I mean, I've seen people. I I know one particular actor does incredibly well. It doesn't utter a word <laughs> during his entire show. Mm-hmm. He just plays nonstop for mm-hmm. for an hour, mm-hmm. and and the audiences go crazy at the end of it. Well, mm-hmm. he doesn't even speak, mm-hmm. so. which is brilliant actually, because it solves the whole problem of <laughs> speaking in different languages and thinking, oh, oh there's a course. load of you know Italians in tonight. What am I going? You mm-hmm. just don't say anything at all. Yeah. So again, I think you have to be true to yourself. Um, I mean, over the years, I've, you know, I'm, I'm not a joke teller. I'm not a comedian. Um, over the years, maybe some, some friends and colleagues have maybe given me a couple of lines to try. That might be a funny throwaway line or in a moment, which maybe I've tried. If it's worked, it stayed. Yeah, I mean, you open with a little gag, and it's really nice. And, it yeah. seems, you know, it, it relaxes people. Exactly. They can see that you're not taking yourself too serious. Yeah. I think it's nice, if you're able to do it, it's, it mm-hmm. is nice, isn't it, to put the odd little... Yeah line in there if you can great but at the end of the day I think you have to be genuine and people see through somebody who's not genuine I mean the chat is the bit that most people will say that they struggle with right they, they, I, I they, think you know. so yeah and, I, and, and how did you approach that was it a challenge did you did you actually <laughs> script it all out or did you did you kind of just did you sort of making it up on the spot and then stuff stuck or did, no. what, did you ever write it down in the very beginning it was a script and that's what I advise every single person to do when you're starting out. Write a script. Um, because e- even at the end of the day, you write the script and you throw it away. You've got to start with some sort of structure, something that is, that, especially if you're not used to doing it. There's nothing worse than, than watching somebody who is very obviously has not scripted anything. And they just they have no clue. They have no clue where they're going in between pieces. They're 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 umming and eyeing and they they, they do, and it's just it's a train wreck. Mm. It's a train wreck watching it on stage. And so I mean I've been helping a few acts in the last year with that element of their show, and especially if you don't speak English as a first language mm. and you have to talk in English. Um, I've said script it. S- literally write a script as if you were doing a TV show or something, mm. um, because then that's your foundation. If you want to. Go off and and I you know and and other tangents. That's fine, but at least you've got a core to come back to, mm. um, you know. And I'm the worst for that sometimes because now twelve years later, I'm very comfortable on stage. I'm very comfortable with not having any script, and sort of winging it and in the moment to see and see where where it goes. Um, but I also know that um, I'm my own worst enemy in that element because I'll go off on a tangent and I have no idea where I'm off to and it takes about 10 minutes to come back mm-hmm. to it before you introduce the piece. Mm-hmm. Uh, in front of my girlfriend recently, I, I put a couple of new things in the show and all of a sudden my show, which was always a tight 45, suddenly became 55 minutes. I was like, but there's, there's not, it's the same number of pieces, it's the same length of time. And uh, she turned and says, yeah, you just need to shut up. (laughs) Just stop talking. You know, because, again, I hadn't scripted what I was going to say between the new pieces that were in the show. And how did you manage, after you scripted the thing, how did you manage to make it, to deliver that script and it not sound like a script? Because that's horrible, isn't it, when you hear people say, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Mm. When I was blah, 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 and, you know, you think, oh, you want to, we need to make it sound like it's spontaneous, like Mm -hmm. it's real, like we are winging it, Mm -hmm. when, of course, we're not. How did you learn how to do that? Because you do it very well. Practice. Right. Like practice off stage and on stage? or uh, uh, Both, Mm -hmm. but especially off stage, before you go on. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, how does any actor you know deliver their lines mm-hmm. in, a, in a TV mm-hmm. show in a mm-hmm. movie uh, without it sounding as if it comes off a script mm-hmm. practice that's their art that's their trade and and at the end of the day you know we're performers musicians singers instrumentalists whatever we do in the moment we're playing or singing whatever that is but we are actors yes in between 
Yes. And, and, you know, take some acting lessons. Go and get some speech lessons. Go, you know, if that is something that's a particularly a troublesome area or something you're not comfortable in, get help. Get a mm. mentor. Get mm. coaching. I mean, I, I still believe in coaching, you know, after all these years. Look at your great, you know, sports stars. Mm. Uh, you know, your Tiger Woods and so on. They still have somebody helps them with their swing every day. Mm. The great opera singers, you know, Pavarotti still had a singing coach. Mm. My kids playing the flute, your kids singing. There's 20, 30 years of, of practice and, and craft have gone into that mm. to be able to stand up and play a song or a sing a song, play a piece, whatever it is. Mm. Just because we talk every day doesn't mean we can necessarily talk on exactly stage. So, yeah. That element takes just as much work mm -hmm. and just as much practice and experience for it to come off naturally. Mm -hmm. um, and definitely one of the best uh, helpful t tips I ever had uh, was from a wonderful comedian called Marty Brill, who I worked a lot with on, on Holland America over the last decade. And uh, he came up to me one day and we were chatting about the show and he was giving me some advice. And, and he said, you know, just just chat. Just talk to them as if you're in the living room. Mm. Just chat as if, like we are right now mm. talking to each other. He says, that's how you connect with them. Mm. You don't have to stand on stage and lecture. You don't mm. have to recite something exactly we're talking about, like a formal script. Mm. Eventually, with practice, that formal script becomes a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Mm. Pick somebody in the audience and talk to them. Mm. Even though there's 2,000 other people in the hall. Yeah. Do you, do you think, uh, or do you appreciate it when other acts give you advice? Oh, oh, very much so, because there's a, you know, e even when you watch it, I mean, I'll, I'll video most of the shows I do, because for me, I find it the best way to critique them, obviously, afterwards. Um, but when you have uh, eyes of a colleague or friend who you trust, obviously, their opinion, um, it, it's invaluable. Because they see it from a, a point of view that you don't. You know, as a flute player, I'm probably caught up in, oh, uh, this particular sound or those keys or, or that, you know, and I've, I know my show inside and out so well that maybe I don't have the ability to really get outside it and look from within. And I could be caught up in something as simple, you know, I could be caught up on the technicality, so I should say, uh, of playing the flute in the show and listening to the band and, and all that. And it could be something as simple as somebody might turn around and say, you know your shoes are dirty? You're right, yeah, yeah. You know? Or do you realize you turn your back on the audience 15 times during mm -hmm. the show? I'm like, oh, you know? And especially what I love is, is when you are, when you have the opportunity to sit down with some, some of your colleagues who have been in this business a long time, from a, a <clears throat> nearly a previous era, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of things that slip by that we don't maybe pay heed to anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, things like making sure you're so well presented or simple stagecraft things that maybe we don't learn in today that, that would have been ground into them um, and how to maybe I just, as I just said you know you just don't turn your back on an audience you walk back a few paces or whatever it might be mm. to make sure you're well, we've got to be careful haven't we because you know I don't know about you but I think <clears> most acts they don't want to walk off stage and have somebody say oh yeah good show by the way Blah, blah, blah. Oh, no, no, there's no, no, a time no, no. and there's a place, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not talking about right after a show. I mean, you know, and a lot of times, you know, I, I mean, I would never turn around and offer advice to anybody. Unless it's invited. Un unless they wanted me to. Mm. I mean, if they, if somebody turned around, if you said to me, hey, you know, give me, let me know, what do you think about the show the other night? Mm. You know, or can you give me some feedback? In, because there may be a particular reason why, and I'll do it all the time with, but I would never go and, and turn around and go, hey, you know, blah, 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 blah. Mm. Um, because it's uninvited and, and it's, it's rude. Mm. You know? You must have spent a lot of time crafting the end, the last bit of your show, because it works very well. You, as I remember, you... <clears throat> Uh, did a number which uh, felt like kind of the ending, but you didn't get people to clap along or anything. There was sort of it was a nice strong number, mm -hmm. and then you had your last number, which it sort of it did it segue straight. It, it sort of you did a little tiny playoff, but you didn't go anywhere, mm -hmm. and you didn't have any announcement from the cruise director or anything. You didn't disappear off stage and make everyone say, "Oh, more, 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 come back." It was a little play. You stayed there, and then it immediately segued into what sounded like a vamp mm -hmm. going round round. So you kept the energy up as they're applauding at the end of your tune, and you're taking your bows. The energy is kept up by the band mm -hmm. with a sort of a happy, I call a happy clappy tune, a fun mm -hmm. thing, which I think was the sort of big. It was a big Irish. Mm -hmm. number for you yeah. um, you credit the band over that vamp 
and then off you go with the tune. And I noticed that you got them clapping along, not at the beginning of the tune, but in the middle of the tune. Mm -hmm. And you've obviously decided each of these things is a, is a choice that you've considered. Uh, very much so. I mean, yeah, we did, uh, uh, what did we do? We had uh, Live and Let Die was, was the final number. Mm. Um, and yes, and I did basically what, what, what we call a false tab, mm. you know, or where, um, you know, they, I've already announced it's the end anyway. Mm. Um, and then uh, from that, yes, I, I went into, uh, I just had the drummer basically uh, take, uh, is, is playing, actually is setting up the tempo mm. for the encore, mm. uh, which was, uh, was the Celtic number. It's kind of interesting, you did that straight away. You know, I did it straight away. Because people are applauding, no you're stops. taking it back, exactly. It's yeah. bangs, go straight yeah. in, and it really keeps the energy up. It wasn't like, hey, that was great, it's going to, you know, your little uh, playoff, and then you kind of let the energy drop, and yeah. it stops, people stop applauding, and then you do a little, well, it's time for the end of the show yeah. now. You go straight in for that mm -hmm. last number. No, I think for me, again, uh, uh, that's very important. Uh, Especially at the end of the show, I wanted to keep the energy up. I wanted to, to, uh, you know, to not let well give people a sense. Just, just not let it die. Exactly as you said. Mm. Um, and then I think it, it builds an enthusiasm also into the last piece and then through the beginning. And a lot of times, I don't get them to clap along, but a lot of times people will start clapping naturally. So I was I noticed that because when you got them to clap there were people clapping along mm -hmm. and then in the middle there's a little break in the middle uh, a band break and you sort of started clapping your hands to encourage other people to clap and it looked to me like you didn't always do that it didn't look like a kind of a choreographed moment no it depends it looked like you thought oh i'm going to do this mm -hmm. now so you wait for their lead or what you depends on the energy in the I'd room say, yeah or? exactly i'll wait on the energy in the room um and and see how the audience are reacting so you, you don't think it's your job to kind of make them i'm gonna get you clappy you'll have a good time no i i i think you 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 can sense that because you'll go on some ships where they just do not want anything to do with that involves any sort of audience participation mm -hmm. uh, but it's often the more in my experience it's the more sophisticated the audience the less they, the want, less to they want to join in. in. And it's yeah. not that they're not having a good time, mm -hmm. they just almost feel it's not beneath them, but they just feel it's a bit naff or they just want to sit yeah. there and be entertained. They don't want to clap along. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, the other evening, uh, it's funny enough because what you witnessed in the second show, I didn't do in the first. Mm. Because uh, we did the show, I was at seven and eight thirty. Because with the seven o'clock crowd, um, I, I didn't feel the same response. I didn't feel mm. the same energy. Earlier in, crowd, they're just more crowd. happier to sit there and yeah. just enjoy the thing. <clears throat> yeah. You know, it's maybe a lighter, lighter audience as well in mm. numbers, mm. and so. Um, you know, in the middle, exactly where that drum solo is, and then I come back in and play, and then they're the last. Uh, it's a it's a Celtic number, so the last one has got three. Uh, sorry, it happens four times. I beg your pardon. The last repeat, and um, normally on the third one, if I feel the energy is there, um, I I stop playing. I thank the band one last time. I and then at that point, before I come back in for the last repeat. I, uh, you know, in, uh, indicate, you know, for them to, to continue clapping. Yes. Um, and then after, because after that, there only really is about 20 seconds left. Because mm. what I find by watching, in my own opinion, is when, if you get somebody clapping along, it's going to fade out very quickly. Mm. So if you do it at the beginning of a piece, what's the point? Mm, mm, mm. Because 20 seconds in, they're out. Mm. You know, so that's why I work it like that, where it's the very, literally the very end. Mm. Um, and then I think it, it just it builds it for the end of the show. It does. It builds uh, the energy in the room. And I, I always find that if they're <coughs> clapping along mm -hmm. when the song finishes, the applause you're going to get is, usually is much greater. Because they're already in it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but as I say, the first show, I didn't do that. So, again, this goes back to what we are talking about in the beginning. It's that flexibility, it's that awareness of who your audience are. Um, what uh, what they want, um, and you know you you try and just give the best uh, product for for the client at the end of the day. So. Mm -hmm. Gary, yeah, it's been great talking to you today. Oh, thank pleasure. you so much for joining us on Cabaret Secrets, and good luck. Thank you very much. Hopefully, we'll see you again soon. Thank you for listening to this Cabaret Secrets podcast. If you've got any comments or questions, please visit cabaretsecrets.com where you'll also find details of the Cabaret Secrets book, an indispensable guide on how to create your own show, travel the world, and get paid to do what you love.